Good morning. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Audit Committee for December 5th, 2022. I'm Lynne Palmasano and I'm chair of this committee. At the time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Committee member Payne is absent. Koski? Present. Singleton? Present. Abeni? Present. Vice Chair Fisher? Present. Chair Palmasano? Present. There are five members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect. We have a quorum and colleagues, our agenda is before us. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So move. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries in the agenda is adopted. Next, we have acceptance of the minutes from our regular committee meeting of November 2nd. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? So move. So move. Second. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries and the minutes are accepted. Next, we'll move on to new business. And for that, we will start with the hiring and promotion process audit report. We have Director Patrick to kick that off. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Palmasano and Audit Committee. Uh, just brief remarks before we get into the presentation. This was an absolutely massive undertaking, uh, one of the most complex and perhaps the longest audit we've ever conducted as a department. It would not have been successful without both uh, the team that I have behind me in internal audit did amazing work on this over a series of months. And I'd also like to thank the HR representatives who helped work with this. They were great partners in this effort and absolutely could not have been successful without their full commitment. They asked for this audit. They were engaged throughout the audit and the success that resulted from it is, is wholly due to the two sets of groups behind me. Uh, I know this is gonna be a long presentation so I won't take up more time. Uh, to begin, I'd like to introduce Nikita Lane, one of our auditors, who will kick off the presentation. Welcome. Good morning. I will begin with the background. It will be followed by the hiring promotion process, themes impacting the hiring process, other no items of note, results and observations in management action plans. As part of our risk-based integrated audit plan approved by the audit committee, the city of Minneapolis internal audit department conducted an audit of the city's hiring promotion processes. Pardon me. The objective of this audit was to examine the process and controls related to hiring and promotions to ensure they are operating efficiently and sufficiently to attract and retain staff. The scope of this engagement included an assessment of the design and operating effectiveness of the processes and controls related to the hiring and promotion process during the time period from Janu January 1, 2017 through March 31st of 2022. The scope covered hiring and promotion processes for most represented and non-represented positions at the city. Most position types were covered, including classified and selected unclassified positions, comprising of department appointed positions, interns, temporary positions, and outside trades. Politically appointed positions were not in scope. The hiring and promotion process at the city is complex with many different rules and guidelines that are dependent on each job position. The civil service rules form a baseline for the classified service, collective bargaining agreements and other policies also guide the process. Hiring managers and departments work with the human resources department and with human resources business partner teams including the representatives and associates to hire and promote. However, the human resources department leads and provides process framework. 
Audit conducted this engagement at a high level to examine the processes involved and did not generally focus on or review specific requisitions, except for demonstrative and sampling purposes and in accordance with the defined testing plan. Hiring and promoting employees is a vital function of the Human Resources Department, one that occurs hundreds of times a year. At the city, Human Resources generally collaborates with individual departments and divisions, requiring a significant amount of work from both. There are many, uh, many sub-processes as part of a hiring and promotion process and different rules, guidelines, and requirements depending on the positions. The Human Resources Department is tasked with responsibilities such as recruitment, testing and selection, job classification, labor relations, employee benefits, administration, among other duties, and is made up of five divisions, including administration, business partner solutions, learning and development, labor relations, and total compensation. A well-defined, documented, and clear hiring promotion process with sufficient oversight and monitoring can help ensure that candidate experiences are fair and positive and in accordance with enterprise expectations. In a highly competitive labor market with especially challenging conditions for the city, the enterprise needs to be able to compete and be attractive for candidates. I will now turn it over to Senior Auditor Travis Cobb. Good morning, Chair of Hamasan, members of the committee. Um, so basically, I'm gonna start by kind of describing the process. And as is, if, if you've seen the report, there's a lot of information, a lengthy report. Um, so I'm gonna kind of do it at a high level, um, try to do things, kind of get the key details if we need. If there's any more specific questions throughout my presentation, you know, including results, um, feel free to stop me, I will provide more, but um, just for time purposes, I'll kind of focus on um, key parts of that, and then I'm happy to provide more details as well as um, defer to HR management as well as they are here to answer any questions. Um, but for kind of just the hiring promotion process, so as kind of Nikita was alluding to, it's a collaborative effort among HR and departments. Um, each kind of are responsible for different aspects of it. And it kind of takes, you know, both departments and HR working together in order to complete the process. Um, it starts with a vacant position generally, um, and then a requisition request is submitted. Um, and there's many sub-processes involved. So the audit kind of focused on a number of those sub-processes as we kind of drill down a little bit deeper um, as um, each kind of area a right for an audit of its own, but we kind of focus on a kind of a high level of those sub-processes and kind of how things interact among themselves. Um, and then the process specifics too is something that kind of complicated things and something that I think is vital to note is that not every process is gonna be consistent or kind of um, they're similar, but there's a lot of variations that may occur just due to the type of position and kind of the nature of um, how things operate the city. So it's kind of something that we kept in mind and considered and kind of also added another dimension through this. Um, and this next slide is kind of a high level diagram um, that HR kind of put together of the hiring and promotion process. Um, just kind of just showing a number of the steps, um, just kind of at a high level, but generally starts with that, re that requisition request or kind of that um, beginning of the process when there is a need to hire. Um, HR is kind of looped in, um, submitted, there's generally a communication among HR and the departments and kind of figuring out in a planning meeting, kind of figuring out the needs, um, kind of figuring out what sort of, um, how to kind of handle the position, discussion position descriptions, other information. Um, a job is posted then by HR. Um, it goes out, you know, for a couple of weeks. It gets, um, applicants come in, HR reviews them. Um, and then departments kind of can get involved in terms of looking at the applications and looking at the second candidates to interview. Um, HR, there might be additional exams that um, HR kind of administers or kind of collaborates with them, and then interviews happen, um, and then depending on the position as well, there might be a background check, a medical check, if a conditional job offer is extended, that is kind of dependent on those tests, and then those are generally handled by a third party, and then kind of the process concludes um, from there. So it's a quite a number of steps, a lengthy process. Um, this kind of next slide, um, we did a hiring manager survey, so you kind of will see throughout the report um, mentions to this hiring manager survey, so we did, um, a survey of kind of the hiring managers of the city. We got a pretty good response rate and kind of got a lot of 
interesting information from them, but we just kind of asked, you know, what is the length of a typical hiring and promotion process? And as you kind of see, it's generally one or two months, three to four months. Um, HR kind of informed us that their time to fill right now, kind of from the start to end of the process, is about 106 days. Um, but of course, that kind of depends on um, the factors of a position. Some positions might go a lot faster than others. For example, if you have like a firefighter acquisition or some of those, they will definitely take a lot longer, more hand, hand, longer to handle versus um, some of those others. But it's generally about three months is kind of a good baseline plan that we identified throughout as this process. So it's, um, it definitely takes up a lot of time and resources among departments and HR. Um, so this next one, so as we kind of we see in the report, we kind of have a couple of pages on kind of themes impacting the process environment. Um, so these were kind of a number of overarching themes that we you know, identify the kind of impact the process in certain ways, um, HR capabilities, impact, you know, the effectiveness of the city. They do not relate to internal controls, but they um, involve just, you know, uninvolved risk, generally not adjustable by audit, um, but they're kind of things that we um, have called out before in a risk assessment, kind of things that we, you know, heard frequently throughout our discussions and throughout our conversations in terms of, you know, what, how the process was operating. Um, so that's kind of why they come in play and just kind of important to understand, you know, in the context of these processes, um, why maybe the things might be not as effective occurring as, as expected is because of these factors. Um, and you'll kind of will see them play out, you know, in some causes and risk, you'll kind of will see um, in the report for some of these specific audit issues where we kind of identified it as a risk or a cause or kind of somewhere in the criteria of um, what's occurring there. Um, but this first one is just kind of the labor market conditions. So we all know the labor market conditions from an employee's perspective right now are challenging, and they're challenging for governments. Um, and this was kind of the number one frequently cited throughout. So that's something that we had a, um, you know, it's tough for everyone kind of that way, but I think it kind of highlights the need too in terms of, you know, the need to be effective, need to have effective processes, need to be efficient in that way. Um, and, the, you know, the city has seen a drop in applications over the past couple of years and also kind of increased turnover, which leads to more acquisitions, more hiring processes, which, um, you know, both decreased applicants just kind of creates a cycle in that way. Um, then turnover has been a factor as well for HR department, um, just kind of impacting them and some of the services that they um, tend to provide, but we're kind of discussed in a couple of slides as well. Um, but again, it just kind of demonstrates the need and kind of, you know, in the team when we were doing this audit, you know, we kind of kept that in mind and, you know, if a process is efficient, is operating effectively, if the city can be competitive, can be, um, occurring because you know if candidates you know aren't having a good experience if they are having frustrations if things aren't occurring as expected you know they'll drop out they will stop responding they go elsewhere um, and then the city kind of uses that way so um, you know it's something we identified too you know we had we asked hiring managers about candidates dropping out of the hiring process and most ha candidates have have had almost hiring managers have had candidates who dropped out of the hiring process and um, it was you know generally um, oh the length of the process, accept other jobs, um, and the inability to be competitive in terms of the compensation, other, other compensation and wages and um, work-life balance was also cited, but um, just kind of as an example here in our survey, we asked, you know, if they feel that the city's hiring process is fast enough for the city to be competitive, and, you know, the overwhelming consensus among hiring managers is that, you know, it's not competitive in terms of speed, you know, it's not competitive that way, so I'm um, just kind of something to keep in mind and something to consider as we kind of consider this um, audit. Another thing, I'm kind of called this out in our 2022 risk assessment, if you were to call but the city's reputation as a work, uh, workplace and employee turnover. Um, so as we kind of cited in our risk assessment, the city's facing staffing and resources challenges that impact department operations and services, burn retention retention issues for the complicate capabilities. Um, and you know, as in our uh, risk assessment last year and kind of moving forward, we identified that, you know, there's a, lot, a major concern of the, among departments was employee turnover, employee burnout, um, which kind of complicates things. You have employee turn, you have to employee turnover. You have positions that are generally vacant then for you know three or four months as the hiring process didn't start until um, the position is vacant, and then you know in, in or other staff members have to fill in, kind of keep up their work, do their duties. I'm um, just kind of creates a cycle of over uh, staff being burned out, getting tired, not being pleased with the city, and then of course just the city's reputation, as we all know, just kind of in the past couple of years. Um, it's been challenging, and that's something that also came up, you know, throughout a lot of people, you know, in terms of why candidates may not be interested in the city. It's, um, you know, a number of factors that I've frequently cited is just the city's reputation and kind of that, um, just knowing that, you know, the, just knowing the recent events and kind of that way, it's uh, more challenging to entice people to work for the city. 
Um, so this was a just kind of a chart. So the um, HR is a, a um, historical turnover trend kind of a, a, a chart on the dashboard that they created of data. And this is kind of an example that um, we kind of put for um, recent months, but just kind of showing it over the last two years. You can kind of see that voluntary turnover has, you know, gone pretty much kind of trended upwards, and if it seems to have leveled off, but you know, just kind of keeping that um, in terms of vacant positions. And I think we cited in a report to, um, you know, right now we're about 3,700 employees, 300, or 3,700, 3, budgeted, we're over 4,000, so there's about, you know, 9% vacancy rate or kind of roughly there across the city overall. And of course, some departments are impacted more than others um, in that aspect as well. Some um, so that there's not an equal effect throughout the city. Um, kind of a last thing that we kind of cited in this theme is kind of the collective bargaining agreements. Um, so there are, um, historically the city has had a number of collective, outdated collective bargaining agreements and when we began this audit, there's a significant more number than there are now. I mean, we have a good progress over the last couple of months, but I mean, some of them date back to two or three years because um, the city in 2020 stopped, froze collective bargaining for a period of time due to the pandemic and un uncertainty and since it kind of take a long time to negotiate, um, come together, at least when we began this audit, there's ones that were still expired in December 31st, 2019. And with those collective bargaining agreements, um, you know, those wages and all those, are the wages and salary schedules don't get updated until the new agreement is reached. Um, so the city, when they're you know, advertising, when employees are looking for jobs, they're using you know, two or three year old or pay, you know, they're using pay schedules that might be out to date. And it may not be clear to them that you know, those may not be the ones that um, will be updated as generally, you know, there is you know, an increase every year, kind of that, and we all know as well in the past couple of years in terms of inflation, in terms of other factors in the market. Um, historically, the city has used a 2.5% number in calculating you know, annual wage increases, which um, you know, may, in the normal times, you know, is, I guess, you know, a good, a decent, a stable number when things are more stable. But as we've kind of seen the last couple of years, you know, with inflation going significantly higher, just kind of, and other employers in other cities or other or private sector, especially, you know, being able to raise and kind of match the market rate for employees in the city is kind of keeping, you know, we're using kind of these, it might be more challenging in terms of just kind of these, the, the numbers that the city is using on that way, so. Um, so we have some other items to note. So these are just kind of some of that, like random things that um, relevant and important to the hiring process we just kind of wanted to mention, but um, as they kind of relate to various aspects. So the first is the gender and race pay equity study. So um, the city is required to conduct a, um, and submit a report on gender pay equity study to the state on a regular basis. Um, the next one is currently submitted to be scheduled in early 2024. Um, as part of this year, though, um, HR informed us that they're working with a consultant to, get a, to conduct a gender and a racial pay equity study. Um, it doesn't appear there's been a racial pay equity study that has been conducted in recent times, but that is kind of something that HR is in the works on and plans for um, to move forward with that. Um, so branding is another aspect, too, as kind of going back to the city's reputation. Um, there's got, you know, serving community, building careers, tagline for the city. Um, but, you know, we've read in recent years have highlighted the recent need for the city to be proactive and, you know, can have a consistent and effective recruiting effort and kind of branding campaign. And you'll kind of see that in one of our observations as well. Um, but there is a new marketing and recruiting campaign in the early stages of work with the consultant. I'm focusing on public safety and other hard to fill con conditions, but it's kind of evaluating um, a number of the city's marketing and um, other efforts as well that way. And then kind of lastly, um, so diversity, equity, inclusion efforts. So the city kind of first says there's a strategic and racial equity action plan, or SREP, that um, division of race and equity and a number of other stakeholders are involved with. Um, an operation by pro priority of that is to diverse, diversify your workforce. And from there, there's you know, a number of initiatives, actions, plans that way. But um, this past year, and kind of, enough, kind of the way this audit kind of came about too, is that there was a workforce DEI strategic plan that was been developed and kind of is in the early stages of kind of ramping up. But there are, from there, there's, a number of goals, initiatives, activities um, that kind of relate, you know, across the whole board in terms of um, diversity, equity, inclusion efforts across the city. And a major goal of that is hiring and promotion processes, um, such as, you know, a goal is to recruit, hire, retain, and advance a high-performing workforce that reflects the residents of Minneapolis. I um, mean, I think you'll see in management responses as well. They kind of refer to that work because there is a significant work kind of going on as well um, that kind of ties into this, but wasn't directly wasn't directly way to some of this, but I think, you know, in terms of aligns, in terms of some of the work that we did and kind of the process that, um, that we looked at and um, in terms of kind of where the department wants to go in the future and kind of how things would match up. Um, so now for the results, um, an overview and kind of key details. 
So kind of a few notes before we um, begin results. So just want to say thank you again to HR management and staff for the time and willingness to work with us. Um, we asked, we worked with them for a period of time. We did pretty extensive um, interviews and discussions with management, with staff, with others involved in the process. Um, you know, in addition to the normal work and kind of the normal time or normal duties as well as um, a number of them are, there's a number of interim positions and kind of turnover in that department too, but we were able to, you know, had a good relationship with them and appreciated their time and effort and they were able to, um, you know, really want to better, you know, look at the process holistically, objectively, and kind of figure out as, you know, part of audit, what can, what are the risk, what can be going better. Um, as well as just kind of a note too, you know, audits are designed to objectively probe and ask the tough questions to identify and highlight, you know, through the audit committee and through places like this, you know, where there are weaknesses, where there is risk, where there processes could be operating better. So it's kind of, you know, a vital, kind of a full circle and just a normal, good, good way for, you know, audits are tough, but in terms of, you know, they benefit, you know, if we kind of complete the process, um, you know, just knowing too that the work is not finished when the report is done, that there's going to be a lot of work in terms of done in the department by management and staff, as well as kind of, you know, work through, you know, we'll be following up in terms of making sure that the risk has been remediated, or if the risk is accepted, communicating to that audit committee, and we kind of anticipate there will be, you know, a full kind of feedback cycle to audit committee as well, kind of in terms of the progress and results. Um, so just kind of a, knowing like that, you know, this report's a good milestone, but there is kind of a lot of behind the scenes work now that will begin and kind of will be involved in this process. Um, so the presentation of results, I'm just kind of gonna cover, you know, the key information, so key observations, um, and as well as kind of the management action plans. If you want more information on anything, feel free to, um, you know, I'd be happy to provide it and kind of jump into that. But I um, mean, just in terms of time purposes, and some of them I'll spend a little bit more time than others, just um, in terms of the details that um, we want to provide. So as you probably saw in the report, there's 19 identified audit issues, 17 of them are rated moderate or high. Um, so these, you know, we had outlined in the report and there's kind of, we'll jump into them. So they cover a number of topics, um, a number of items. I think the kind of the first two policies and procedures and oversight monitoring, you'll see, you know, throughout most of the audit result, or most of the observations, kind of a similar um, language or kind of specific information on that. We kind of did a, looked at policies and procedures and oversight monitoring as a whole, and then kind of for specific processes, kind of drilled a little bit deeper and kind of identified specific instances or occurrences with those. I'm sure we'll kind of see a lot of carryover in terms of these themes as everything kind of, you know, not, uh, as, part, as part of one primary promotion process, you know, everything kind of relates and flows through together that way. Um, so kind of first starting off with policies and procedures. Um, so, you know, this was, we had, uh, the issue was policy and procedure documents are not current and complete to sufficiently describe hiring and promotion processes. Um, so I think this was kind of a key foundational one that we um, looked at and you kind of will see throughout, um, throughout there, but basically we identified the not clear policies and procedures covering the entire hiring and promotion process and, role, um, and roles, responsibilities, requirements, and expectations are not defined or included. Um, they do not, hiring policy and procedures do not follow co a common organizational structure, um, which kind of inhibited kind of, um, a user's ability to kind of get a complete and comprehensive understanding of the policy and procedures, kind of identifying clearly, you know, what is a requirement, what is the recommendation, what is um, a vital aspect of this, or what um, that guideline there. And then as well, there's not a formal change, in, there's not a formal consistent change management process in place. Um, so we noted a number of documents are outdated or not dated at all, um, which kind of, you know, inhibits, hard to tell if a doc, if this process or information is kind of described is um, what is occurring or not, or what it should be occurring right now. And knowing too that a lot of processes have changed, a lot of things have changed in recent years, kind of hiding the importance to keep, um, you know, defined processes, kind of define um, those procedure documents and set those expectations. Um, so kind of in terms of management action plans, so kind of first, kind of before you begin, it's kind of an overarching one, but kind of this, um, as part of this management action plans for this engagement, um, human resources management is developing a detailed roadmap of remediation activities that designed to address the observations and risks identified throughout this report. Um, these plans will take time and may require additional resources um, to implement fully. As the plan develops and activities start occurring, it is anticipated that management will provide updates to the audit committee as well as highlight any additional resources or work that may be necessary um, kind of throughout the next six to 12 months and kind of beyond that as well. Um, but for the policies and procedures specifically, um, HR management in consultation with the city attorney's office will determine what aspects of the hiring promotion process should be considered policies, procedures, or guidelines. Um, all current department and enterprise policies and procedures um, will be reviewed for designation or designation needed updates, additions, and deletions. Um, they will use a 2007 exam 
hand, manual handbook that we identified um, as kind of a foundation to create this um, guide as a new holistic hiring promotion process and procedure handbook. So there was um, a, 2000, a guide that was from 2007 that kind of outlined a number of processes that was kind of contained some great detail and kind of updating and using that as a moving forward. As well as identifying or creating a, a, new, a detailed process and procedure manual for HR staff involved in the hiring promotions. Um, and then from another aspect of that is how all policy process and procedure documents will be communicated to HR staff and hiring managers incorporated the process and system training courses and published in City Talk. Um, for you know, a, a part of the management action plan, they identified you know, a potential need for more resources in terms of staff to kind of fully implement. Um, but it's kind of anticipated that by June, the kind of the, um, the, fact, the initial expectations and policies will be defined and then kind of by the end of the year, um, all processes will be um, remediated or included in that one. Um, second issue is oversight monitoring. So oversight monitoring of human resources department involvement and responsibilities of the hiring promotion process needs formalizing and strength strengthening. So we identified here um, a number of observations, but just kind of related to that, but basically there's insufficient oversight over the entire uh, hiring promotion process with an opportunity to define and formalize controls. Um, so policies and procedures do not contain specific oversight monitoring activities that are expected or should be included. Um, they are not defined documented controls over the hiring process, such as the preventative or detective controls in place during the hiring promotion process. Um, and then human resource business partner teams have different operating structures, um, different um, activities or hierarchies and oversight of kind of what the team, individual teams are doing and kind of what is occurring within the team is inconsistent and not um, documented as well. And then you know, management has identified reports, created reports for the selected parts of the process that can provide analysis, um, such as after a process, a kind of insight to it, um, but it's not kind of formally incorporated into you know, policy and procedure and kind of oversight monitoring um, plan. So the kind of the management action plan for this one is to um, standardize team structure and define roles and responsibilities within and among team and management to ensure controls, oversight, and consistency in process and procedures um, meet expectations. Identify key process risks, define baseline oversight of when approvals or um, sign-offs should be required, and incorporate into policies and procedures um, in line with kind of the work in issue one. And then create a system of check and balances, including a tracking mechanism for real-time oversight activities um, documentation requirements, um, approvals where necessary, and where um, management's role and kind of outlining management's role in reporting, audit trails, um, and at remedial actions. Um, and then kind of a last part of this is search um, various ten acquisition models to determine if a centralized model is a viable option for, this, for the human resource department to, um, to incorporate, which could centralize management authority, control, roles, and responsibilities. Um, kind of a target remediation date um, initially is kind of short term um, by April 1st or and then a kind of longer term of structure evaluation by um, December 1st. Um, the next one is the background check process. Um, so background check policy procedures are not updated or sufficient to ensure consistent and secure process controls. So we identified a number of observations within the background check process. Um, but basically, you know, first po policy and procedures do not Reflect current, um, and current processes do not reflect data and IT security best practices. There's a lack of detailed supporting information to guide background check processes, as well as opportunities to ensure practices are designed and occurring in accordance with data security best practices. So there's a lack of oversight monitoring of the activities in kind of this area. Um, there's not a documented process to handle potentially disqualifying information. So if a candidate background check comes back with information on it, I'm kind of documenting kind of the process that should be, um, that is evaluated kind of considered in terms of if their information does come back on the background check, you know, if something should be, if it's something the city can work around or kind of that way or kind of there's a pro there's discussion and kind of a process behind the scenes but that is not formally documented or um, included in there. And then there's not a doc comprehensive list of positions that require a background check. So it's kind of a manual, it's a process kind of, they're looking at each policy, looking at kind of that way and kind of determining if a background check is needed but there's not a, you know, detail that's kind of identifying the need or what background check as well as the sort different sort of background checks that may be required as well. And I will note too, there is um, a, C a criminal justice information system CJS background check that we did not include as part of this process uh, that is managed by the police department. And it's a diff little bit more different process, but, um, but there are a number of city employees in the police department and elsewhere um, in terms of needing access to criminal justice information. There is a different background check process that occurs for those as well. Um, 
So as part of the management action plans, our HR management will continue um, to review current background check policies, procedures, um, and resource documentation with a focus on industry and IT best practices, and then update and incorporate those into the handbook for hiring managers. Um, management was, a, there was as well um, something that we identified throughout um, in terms of um, cybersecurity concerns related to um, the background check process and how information is transmitted. So, um, um, Management is, part of the management is part of the response said that, you know, they completed the initial step of that process, but we'll be able to provide documentation to us confirming that it's been remediated in February. And then um, HR management will identify all positions that require a background check, creating a list that includes each component that needs to be checked, which will be reviewed annually. Um, and then research best practices and legal defensibility with the city attorney's office on the conformance with Minnesota statute to create a standard criteria in determining potential disqualifying convictions, key process, pre-processes requiring panel review and approval we identified, documented, and communicated, work with the IT department um, in terms of document storage and retention, and then um, as well management is exploring the integration of a background check process or integration within NeoGov or other systems. Um, so it's currently the, a third party vendor is used um, kind of another system and kind of that way, um, but exploring potential possibly in the future kind of an update down the line. Um, so target remediation date, so by February 1st, that short-term process and procedure documentation, um, August 1st for policy process and procedure updates, and then December th um, 31st in terms of the background report evaluation and adverse action criteria and documentation and kind of that RFP for um, potential other solutions. Um, a fourth audit issue also related to high is related to medical tests and pre implement drug and alcohol tests. So this one is pretty similar in terms of the background check process, um, in terms of the process, in terms of what is included and I'm kind of a findings, but policies and procedures related to pre-employment drug and alcohol tests and other medical exams are outdated or un unclear. Um, so we have a pre, uh, the city has a pre-employment drug and alcohol policy and procedure. However, there's a lack of pos or policies and procedures covering other medical tests. So there may be tests such as physicals um, for public works or kind of other Strength ones for pub firefighters have a um, national standard that they go by. Um, there's not, you know, documented policy and procedures for those kind of tests, um, you know, such as how the information is, how the information is conducted, who conducts them, how to go about the process of administrating them. Um, there's a kind of a lot of historical and kind of staff knowledge in terms of how to operate and go about it, um, those processes. Um, similarly, in terms of, you know, what sort of tests are required or should be considered, um, kind of the background check, you know, there's not a comprehensive list or kind of that one is kind of handled. Um, by the business partner teams. Um, we kind of identified two, there's uncertainty and confusion um, in terms of the communication to candidates, in terms of if, what they should say when scheduling tests, you know, if they allow just a tell the candidate when they're scheduling a test, um, you know, if the test is for a drug test or, or, a pre or alcohol test, or if they allow to kind of that, what sort of information they allow to convey before um, the process. And then also there's kind of that last, last need to consider incorporate data security and IT best practices into the process as well. So management action plan, so create a policy process um, and comprehensive operating procedures and um, documentation regarding medical testing requirements, which will be incorporated into kind of the work from um, observation one. Document will include standard required steps and based on expectations, roles and responsibilities, oversight monitoring activities, and government data, data retention requirements. Um, in collaboration with departments, identify and comp uh, compile a comprehensive list of all city positions that require a drug and alcohol test and a medical test, including the specific test protocol utilized um, by the city's provider. So the city uses third-party providers as well for these, and um, you know some positions may require, depending on the circumstances, you know these tests are considered. Others may not necessarily do not require those um, tests to be handled. Um, and then HR review and update can make notifications to reflect clear and consistent messaging on what tests have been performed and um, testing expectations and then reviewing um, data security and protection practices um, to make sure that they align with enterprise expectations and working with city clerk's office, IT, and the vendors to resolve any issues and make sure that um, at, er, corporate guidelines in the policy and procedure documents. And the target mediation date of this is for August 1st, 2023. Um, I'm next gonna turn over to Common Alliday for a couple of other issues. Mr. Com. Um, yep. Before you go, there are a couple questions on the dais for your section. Did you want to take those now, or we could wait till the end of the... Uh, whatever you prefer. Would be Let's go ahead. Um, Mr. Fisher has a comment or question about this, just this last section. Yes, thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, Mr. Kam, I, I'm going to interpret the last section being the first four <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, issues that have been raised. 
<clears throat> but the question, one of the questions I have have to do with something with the other issues as well. In part three, item three, background check process, <coughs> in the description that was uh, in the written materials, there was an indication that there was some differences in procedure under the collective bargaining agreements. And I just have to ask myself, and so ask you and the audit team, is there a recommendation that there be some coordination around the um, negotiation of collective bargaining agreements to make sure differences in procedures and processes are at least uh, um, somewhat consistent? Mm -hmm. Chair Palmasano, committee member Fisher, thanks for that question. I think you'll kind of see that as you kind of identified throughout a lot of those things. Um, I think we evaluate the processes are and do not make recommendations in terms of the collective bargaining agreements. As we know, they are, it's a complex negotiation process, complex in that way, and in terms of our scope and kind of expertise, just kind of identifying um, the current processes and kind of how they are defined. But I think in terms of, you know, consistency and kind of alignment and kind of that way, um, I think that is, you know, an important conversation that could be had, you know, I think maybe HR management or others might be able to provide that. But in terms of, um, you know, we, we need to identify inconsistencies in the process. We are going off of HR's processes and kind of that one um, and not kind of necessarily calling out specific disagreements or differences among collective bargaining agreements as that is, um, we felt that was kind of out of our scope and kind of our area um, of expertise to kind of call out or identify those. Okay. Thank you. Committee member Singleton. Thank you, Chair Palmazano. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to clarify also in the background check process, um, it notes that there are urgent cybersecurity concerns. And so have those been remedied and we're just waiting on documentation? Um, yeah, so he's, yeah, I kind of pointed out. So yeah, there was um, some stuff, uh, concerns that we brought throughout this engagement. Um, management says they have, um, we made it or kind of completed it, but we haven't got documentation yet. I think um, if they want to kind of elaborate a little bit more on that, but um, I think, you know, in terms of the one that specific instance that we discussed or kind of identified, but I think, you know, as you kind of saw throughout too, there is kind of that plan to um, work with IT kind of and others as a more comprehensive, you know, this was a kind of just a single, um, the fix kind of was a single occurrence or kind of a single part of the process and not necessarily holistically. So I think, you know, there is work to be done yet in terms of working with kind of stakeholders in terms of creating that holistic, um, making sure that all the process and not just um, that specific part that was identified and correct, or, um, corrected and kind of brought to the attention during this engagement. Thank you. That's all for now. Perfect. Go ahead to come. Madam Welcome. Chair, committee member, good morning. I'm going to cover issue five and six. Uh, issue five is related to job study, class maintenance study. Job study and class maintenance study are not occurring regularly or consistently across the city. Uh, OD observed that it's not currently ongoing a schedule or system to ensure class maintenance study occur in accordance with the language included in the a collective bargain, bargaining agreement. The, the Women, Women Resource Department does not currently have a system to review position in a regular or written basis to ensure the work being performed is still, is still in line with the duty for uh, the position was a great originally. Job review and po uh, we, we observe that job review and position study are not occurring on a regular basis to ensure position and expectation are still to the position and accurate. So there's a language in the civil service role and the quality bargain agreement include that kind of study can go and give it some the timeline on, on that one. And the management response to, to the, the good news that two classification and compensation analysis have been higher start and starting on November 29 this year. And the main focus will be 
the management and completion of the class maintenance study. HR management will ensure that the classification and compensation we need to develop, maintain, and document a class maintenance schedule so that job are reviewed according to the timeline frame specified in the civil service rule and labor contract and document. The classification website will be updated to define key classification terms reflect the role and responsibility of uh, HR and the supervisor and clearly define the processes for class maintenance and classification study. The HR will incorporate a procedural guidelines define the type of job description charge that require classification review. So the target remediation date will be August 1st, 2023. Issue six, data collection, storage, information governance. Data practices are not incorporated into policy and procedure around hiring and promotion to ensure that data is stored in accordance with expectations set by management. OG observed that it's a lack of clear current policy and procedure incorporating that data practices such as gathering, storing, and re returning data from the hiring and promotion processes. There is a lack of governance regarding oper operational policy and procedure for data collection and storage guidelines for human resource department staff to utilize for the hiring and promotion processes. Data retention schedule are not incorporated into hiring and promotion related documents. The management will collab collaborate with the city clerk office, city attorney office, and the IT department to establish operational information governance policy and practices that address the creation, collection, management, storage, location, assess, protection, use, retention, destruction, oversight and compliance, auditing of hiring and promotion data, including collection of PII. Throughout the full hiring process, life cycle in accordance with their practice and record retention requirement. The policy process, procedure, and role and responsibility governance document will be incorporated into the handbook for hiring manager and HR staff manual. Training completion will be officially documented and incorporated into onboarding plan. A data practice confidentiality agreement is being created for H all HR staff involved in hiring processes. Review and update the affirmation action acknowledgement that is required for all of all interview panel members, include their practice and record retention requirement. HR management will work with the city clerk office and IT department to explore a way to extrapolate and aggregate net NeoGov and for historical analysis and re reporting update. NeoGov is the system that HR use with uh, the uh, comment, HR comment, the people soft, uh, uh, software that I use to, to manage the, the, the process. HR management will evaluate process and system to identify ways, streamline, reduce handoff and inefficiencies, and this decrease the number of the number of the system and source of information needed to complete hiring-related tasks. The target remediation date is July 1st, 2023, for the establishment of governance document and training. 
December 31st, 2023, new Gov recall retention and destruction policy and procedure. And I'll turn back to Mr. Travis for the issue seven, but if you have any question, I'll be happy to address that. I'm not seeing any, Mr. Adelaide. Sure, promise I'm a member of the committee, so for issue seven, I'm under the interview process. Um, so there's a lack of documented policies and procedures and training to, to ensure the interview process is, is consistent across the enterprise. So we identified <coughs> a number of, acti a number of um, specific kind of um, items for this audit issue. Um, kind of first is related to the hot policy and procedures for the interview process, so not clear, current, and complete to guide human resources department, staff and department hiring managers through the hiring promotion process, and ensure adequate oversight, um, such as, you know, in terms of, you know, the responsibilities, requirements for conducting interviews, kind of expectations, um, you know, in terms of what is required or what not, might not be required. Um, for instance, we, there, um, yeah, and then there is not documented oversight and controls over the interview process to ensure expectations are being followed, including in areas such as questions and scoring. Um, interview, HR human resources review and approval of interview questions is not documented or consistent. Um, and the kind of the guidance for interview question design and development is not always clear and consistent as well. Um, and then there is not always a clear um, a, a clear expectation of how to rate candidates or kind of how to score interviews, um, responses and questions. Um, as part of this, and you're kind of seeing the training as well, but um, there's not required documented and tracked training for hiring managers. There's not, there's just training for hiring managers before the interview process, um, but in terms of um, there's conflicting language and kind of how it's required and kind of as well, um, uh, as well as um, focuses only on unconscious bias. So there is kind of that, but there's no kind of follow through to ensure that it is recurrent. Uh, interview panel participants have completed it prior to an interview. Um, and then interview responses and scores are always not always considerably documented um, or kind of and maintained in accordance in a specific location. So we've kind of identified as part of our uh, inquiries um, in terms of what, how interview question or interview question scores and kind of that you know responses are held, and sometimes it's held in departments, sometimes it's held in HR. Um, there's not that kind of clear standard that you know HR holds is an owner of these or departments should kind of maintain these documents and kind of that as well. Um, so the management action plan kind of rates to issue one again, or um, that remission plan of audit issue one, which is all current department policy and procedures, um, will be. Review with a focus on industry best practices and updated incorporating to the handbook uh, for interview question design based the question design and development um, using the enterprise competency model. Um, HR is currently creating a comprehensive database of approved competency based interview questions accessible to hiring managers and HR staff. Um, for rating forms, research best practices and models for standard interview rating forms that are objective, job related, and inclusive of competency based evaluation criteria. Um, Require and document interview panel training required by HR staff, which includes just-in-time unconscious bias training and panel member expectations. Um, and then for records retention, um, require all interview rating forms to be stored electronically in the New York of applicant tra tracking system in accordance with um, the records retention schedule. I um, anticipate that this, these will be done by September 1st, 2023. Um, kind of before I turn over to comment for the next one, so this one is kind of a unique one that a rose of this engagement as part of our um, inquiries and observations um, in terms of informer employee back being kind of different um, unclear expectation kind of how this should be handled in this one um, as you're kind of seeing the management response is kind of re it's a sign of the city attorney right now to kind of figure out or kind of um, provide those things but I'm um, common will have more details on this one chair Parmesano committee members issue the issue eight is for related to former employee back pay. So this, we come across this through the discussion is now really related to the hiring process where when audit, in audit work, we observe a weakness somewhere, so we go there, we, we need the, the management to address that as well. So the city responsibility around back pay for former employees as a result of updates collecting bargaining agreement are not clear. Though sometimes there's a, 
background agreement expire and for employees still working on the previous agreement until they have a, a new agreement in place. So OD identify inconsistency related relating to employee who had left the CD while working on the expired college bargain agreement. And a lack of clarity among CD department on how to handle any resulting back pay. For current employee, when a new collective bargaining agreement is reached, the payroll division receive notification in the CD comments. So HR system, they receive that from HR system that the pay rate change occur and retroactive pay is due to employee cover by that agreement. Former employee currently are able to request the retroactive pay from the city if new agreement is reached and the city calculates and pay that. But OD observed that the unclear process includes the lack of writing policy for retroactive pay to former employees. Management and staff re rely on historical knowledge and practice, but management has not established a policy or writing a procedure for covering back payment in these circumstances, if in fact such payments are permissible. The city rely on informal channel to notify former employees, such as union representative, but does not currently send out information, provide clarity in this sequence. It's like if the former employee, a former employee does not request that payment, this seems like uh, they are not getting just those payments, so they have to request that. But for the current apply, uh, employees, they, they can, the, the system that goes directly to common system and the notification go to pay the payroll and they process the, those payments. So we, that was unclear, we work with our city attorney office to find out any kind of law or regulation around this and the city attorney office agree with the recommendation to reach, to research it determined the city responsibility and authority related to retroactive compensation for former employees as it related to retroactive quality bargaining agreements. The city attorney office committed to conducting the required legal analysis and advising the human resource department and the payroll division on legal obligation and authority. No, no later than June 1st, 2023. Although the city attorney office does not have a responsibility for related policy and procedure document, the city attorney office will collaborate with both the human resource department and the payroll division and will make itself available to review, to review and advise on any resulting procedure. The target remediation date is, like I say, is June 1st, 2023. Mr. Fisher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, Mr. Lead, I, I uh, have identified this particular area of former employee back pay as being having legal implications for the city. Obviously, people with rights are going to have the right to enforce those rights. So I see where this where this office of the city attorney would be involved with this. But I also wonder if there isn't a tracking issue. How do we find these employees if they, former employees, they've left the city employment? Um, they may have a change of address. They may have moved out of the city. They may have had certain changes of circumstances. So is there a recommendation from the audit, uh, our audit group that there be some kind of tracking system put into place so we can uh, evaluate how to reach these individuals? Chair Parmesano, committee member Fisher, 
Yes, in the course of this audit, we work, we go work with finance and payroll and HR. You know that when employees separate from the city, they have, they provide addresses, they provide kind of documentation where, to, for example, city will send them the W-2 form kind of stuff, but if it takes too long, they see finance department advisors that to, if they reach out, if they just print the check and send out, that will be issued with the person leave or change address. So we recommend that they reach out to people. But in the course of this, we want we we say legal implication in this. We want to be careful on that as well. So sometimes if we have a legal implication, we consult with uh, a CD attorney office to advise us. So at the end, we conclude that they will still work with the HR and HR payroll and finance as a whole to determine the, the, the process to take and to fix or to remediate this issue. And just follow up, Chair Palmasano. Uh, thank you for that. I can't help but quote an NPR story I heard this morning, um, on the radio, that is, on exit interviews being done for um, employees leaving employment. Do we know of any um, interest in the HR department to do exit interviews to keep track of people leaving uh, city employment? I want to join back to the HR department. Mr. Champa is going to come up. He's our interim chief human resources officer. I do know that exit interviews are conducted, Mr. Champa. I think that is an at will kind of request and a com you know a and process. Can you tell us a little more? Yes. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, committee member Fisher, to your question, <clears throat> we do conduct exit interviews, they are uh, voluntary. We probably have about a 10 to 15% response rate. We do them in a couple of ways. Uh, we have a um, online survey that is sent to every departing uh, employee, and we also offer to meet with employees. Um, I can speak specifically uh, to exit interviews in the HR department, as we've seen uh, tremendous amount of turnover in the last year or so, about 40%. And um, we have conducted an exit interview with every employee who's left. That's an anomaly. In the rest of the city, it's much, much lower. For example, in the police department, where we've also seen a lot of uh, departures, uh, it's probably about 5 to 7%. Uh, and, and then um, the, the themes in terms of why employees are leaving vary uh, tend to vary by department. Help. Any other question related to pay back pay? Not right now. I'll turn back to Charles. Chair Palmasano, members of the committee. Um, so that kind of concludes the high rate audit issues. The next ones are. Next group are going to kind of already a moderate um, kind of throughout, and kind of the three for these next two um, kind of the theme of communication um, in terms of I think you, as well as kind of throughout many of the observations, kind of the things you noted about, but just kind of some overarching themes again related to ensuring that everyone knows what's going on and everyone's updated and commu communication is you know essential part of the process and um, making sure that people know what to do you know in terms of uh, and how to go about it and kind of easing some frustrations and that way. So the first one is communication with human resources. Um, so this one's kind of related to um, hiring managers and kind of internal, but you know, expectations and process information are not always clearly understood by hiring managers. Um, so there's a lack of clear policy and procedure information as well as process guides. I think as you identified, it's kind of um, on issue one. Um, you know, audit, hiring managers may have a general understanding of the hiring promotion process um, and the responsibilities, but there's a lack of specific understanding of the process and a desire to understand process better and kind of more clarity. I think that kind of, as part of a hiring manager survey, there is some sense of frustration and kind of some uncertainty because they don't necessarily know, you know, what goes on among HR, kind of what goes beyond the scene or kind of how to go about the process because um, it's not always clear and that just kind of creates additional time frames, more frustration, more, um, you know, more, more need to kind of fix things after or communicate after the fact. Um, you know, there are process guides and checklists can be used to describe um, 
and guide hiring managers through the process. Um, however, they vary and are not generally required, and it's unclear you know, how or if they're consistently used. So there's a number of different hiring promotion guides, um, but there's not one that's consistently implemented or used, and I think kind of related back through, um, as we identified an audit issue, um, one earlier in the report, um, in, terms of, you know, in terms of resources for hiring managers, um, there is steady talk, which is a significant source of re information for hiring managers, but in terms of, uh, as a source of information, um, you know, a lot of the process users weren't, didn't even identify, or, or less than about half when we cited as an example of a source, and then kind of like expressed a need in that survey as well for more information, more resources, more clarity that way. Um, so we kind of identified that as a communication aspect. Um, so, you know, the hiring manager, management action plan for this one is using the hiring manager survey feedback. HR management would develop a standard hiring packet resource and process guide to provide hiring managers a high level visualized process workflow guide, roles and responsibilities matrix, job specific timeline and itemized task checklist, um, as well as expectations to discuss at the planning meetings as um, other discussions as well. Um, new HR management would explore the uh, possibility of modifying existing new functionality. Um, or advocating for new functionality, incorporate checklist forms and templates into exam plan um, routing, and then HR management institutes a recurring communication channel with HR staff as part of the change management practice. Um, and this is target mediation date of June 1st, 2023. Um, so the next one is related to communication, but this one is kind of candidate communication. So this is um, how the city or how how we manage in HR um, commit to candidates. And this was um, candidate communication expectations, responsibilities, throughout the requisition lifestyle, like a are not clearly defined. So there was some confusion and uncertainty in terms of who should be communicating, how to be communicating, and I think in terms of um, you identify as part of this one, and if candidates get ghosted by the city or they don't get timely notifications of what occurs next, if they don't kind of get that standardized feedback, you know, you might move on in the process. You might go find other opportunities. You might, um, you know, think that you're not, the city's not interested in you, and it just may be a lack of communication occurring. Um, so that's when we just identify an opportunity to kind of show up and confirm um, those roles and responsibilities. Um, so again, kind of, you know, there's a lack of policy procedure and clarity around the communication expectations. So, you know, if, if hiring managers should be the ones communicating or if the HR should be the one um, communicating um, as part of observations, it was kind of generally a mixture of both. Um, but it kind of varied by the requisition and kind of the involvement as HR is kind of more involved in some processes than others. Um, but there was kind of not that document that kind of like one way that we can kind of confirm or um, show up that way. Um, you know, communi communication can this may be referenced in some of the guides. Um, however, these guides are not, er, are not required or consistently followed, um, as it kind of ignored in the last one, and kind of or, um, can't, and kind of throughout this one in terms of requirements and um, expectations, and then as well, um, civil service rules include language and communication. However, um, in terms of you know creating policy and procedures and their own policy and procedures to make it clear um, has not been developed, as well as um, there's some specific language about notifi not notification to veterans and the civil service rules that um, we did not identify corresponding policy and procedure language for. Um, management action plan for this one, so kind of related to audit issue one, developing um, in accordance with the results from audit issue one, that's policy and procedures, um, incorporating required kind of, required kind of communication into the exam planning checklist, um, and those other guides, as well as a sign off upon completion. Um, and then management requires that all candidates acknowledge that communication to them from the city is primarily via email. If any other communication um, is used due to, experience, or due to other demands, um, note, making notation of that command, uh, information in NeoGov, because um, NeoGov is the source of um, allow, ability to send out communications um, and kind of track them through there. But if communications outside occur outside of NeoGov, it's not, not, you know, not necessarily with the requisition or able to be easily tracked. And the HR management will audit all exam plans to ensure candidate notification um, are com consistently being sent. Um, the remission date for this one is April 1st. Um, so the next one is kind of another uh, candidate recruiting. And we identified a number of kind of opportunities throughout this one as well um, as recruiting is you know, a central function uh, in terms of making sure that, you know, uh, in terms of you're getting qualified, qualified to get, uh, uh, applicants and being able to get um, kind of the applicant pool that the city needs. And um, so we noted this one that the human resource department recruitment function is not formally integrated into the hiring process. So we identified a number of um, items for this one, but you know, there's not defined policies and procedures um, for recruiting, including expectations and guidelines from human resources department management. So there was some uncertainty as well in terms of you know who should be the ones recruiting or kind of how to be going about it. Um, if departments should be the ones covering 
recruiting expensive, HR should. There are some departments that have their own recruiting functions or capabilities, um, such as police, um, public works, and kind of some of the others that have maybe a designated role or kind of designated step people who can kind of handle, kind of can be the point person. Um, but you know, a lot of departments rely on HR for the for that um, basis and kind of for that um, assistance. Um, the city's recruitment function is not incorporated into the hiring process from the onset of acquisition process with a lack of a design recruitment plan. So we identify through this one, you know, generally when recruit, recruit may, may get involved, it might be later in the process, such as, you know, on their own course or kind of throughout um, other opportunities, but there's not kind of a formal notification, kind of formal integration that HR, you know, that there is a requisition that they need to be kind of be involved on and that may result in them coming to a process late, um, having to, you know, extend the process to get candidates kind of related to that way, but there's not that, you know, formal kind of, um, laid, you know, formal expectation, kind of that formal plan where they kind of get involved they to, you know, that policy procedure um, first one as well. Um, the roles and capabilities of the recruitment function are not clearly communicated to hiring managers. So there was some uncertainty of kind of, you know, what does, what can recruitment do? Do, do they post to job boards? Do they do, you know, job fairs? On that, it's not always, you know, the capabilities and what the, they can offer is not you know, clearly understood by hiring managers across the city. Um, there is some effort of recruitment efforts and results, but results information are not always clearly communicated. So again, kind of communicating through you know, how successful a communication or recruiting effort was, you know, if it resulted in candidates, if it resulted in you know, touch points or kind of that engagement, there's not that formal kind of mechanism to ensure that you know, hiring managers and staff are kind of getting that information that they need to you know, know you know, if their efforts were successful or not. And then communicate relationships with community and employment organizations are not formally documented. So there's a lot of, you know, formal, informal kind of touch points, kind of a lot of knowledge in terms of, you know, working with um, organizations, working with groups, kind of creating, you know, those partnerships and networks. And there's an opportunity to kind of formally document and kind of make consistently, um, you know, make formalize those relationships. So management action plan for this one. Um, so kind of starting first, the formal recruitment function as the city is relatively new. Um, it was designed to provide targeted recruiting with an emphasis on hard to fill positions. Um, HR management acknowledges the urgency of maturing this function over the next couple of years um, and kind of aligning with critical HR priorities. Um, kind of the next part of the plan is kind of again that policy procedure update as related to audit issue one. Um, recruiter roles and responsibilities. Um, for the second recruiter position created in 2022, HR management will continue to define the primary roles and responsibilities. Um, employment brand recruiting campaign. So the HR received ARPA funds um, from a vendor to hire a vendor to review and modify the city's current employment brand and to create a full recruiting and marketing campaign um, to market to position the city as an employer of choice. Um, the project was expected to kick off this month. Um, recruitment plans, as there was limited capacity, uh, limited capacity for recruiters to be involved in all plans. Um, strategic or <coughs> um, become, uh, develop plans for strategic enterprise and hard to fill recruitment plans of. Uh, Develop strategic and enterprise and hard to fill recruitment plans um, for those positions and can then communicate those out to um, the parties. Data results in reporting. So, HR management is beta testing um, NeoGov functionality in two areas in terms of um, that they anticipate will enhance recruitment plans and efforts. And then there's kind of additional need for you know, potential resources and kind of consideration of a um, possibility of a customer relation uh, management software, kind of a way that they can formally track and um, in incorporate those uh, into a system. Um, so they identified some the resources they anticipate might be needed for this one, such as um, general funding for the opera recruiter position, um, additional FTE, um, kind of some software updates, and then kind of some, you know, in terms of recruiting efforts, such as job fairs, um, other recruiting needs um, that they anticipate might be needed as part of their efforts to resolve this one. But um, this one, there's kind of a number of due dates, um, kind of first one in July, and then kind of carrying through through 2024 in terms of the longer range plans. Um, so the next one is training. So training again is a, a central part of you know for this one relates to training for staff as well as hiring managers, or uh, kind of both parts of the process and kind of a neat we identified training policies and procedures for human resource department, business partner staff, and hiring managers are not clearly and formally defined. Um, so there is training that occurs, but there's not kind of formally defined and kind of clear for us. As part of our ones, you know what training might be, what training is expected that way. So we observed the lack of clear training expectations um, related to hiring promotion processes. Um, you know, there's from both hiring managers and, and HR staff. There is, um, you know, as I said, there's training. There's other opportunities occurring, but there's uh, an opportunity to kind of formalize it into policies and procedures and create those clear expectation guides. As um, there's not a mechanism in place as well to ensure that training occurs and 
in line with management expectations, um, such as before a process starts. And then there's unclear um, you know, roles and responsibilities in terms of you know, who should be ensuring that training is occurring. So just for hiring managers, is it a responsibility of HR business partner staff or kind of others to you know, make sure that such as unconscious bias training was completed before um, an interview process, for example. So management action plans, so they're evaluating the hiring process and systems training programs for um, both HR business partner team staff and hiring managers. Um, management will review all current training offerings and solicit feedback um, or training experiences. Upon training redesign completion, written training expectations and procedures will be developed and incorporated into the handbook um, kind of related to issue one. A training roster for new HR business partner staff will be included in the onboarding plans. Um, communication and required training courses will be made through multiple channels for hiring managers, um, such as the exam meeting, plan meeting, exam planning meetings, um, newsletters, and the handbook on Tilly Talk, and then um, identify and implement a centralized system to track and monitor training requirements and um, completion. Um, target remediation date, um, training program design and complete implementation by December 1st, and then kind of April 1st, 2024, um, the completion of on-demand refresher training tutorials. Um, so the next one is workforce development. So it's not a clear and centralized approach to workforce development opportunities such as pathway programs and apprenticeships. So across the city, there are a number of um, opportunities, there's a number of positions that are kind of uh, identified as kind of workforce development, such as uh, opportunities in police, public fire, public works. These may be you know, training programs, apprenticeship programs, cadets programs. Um, there are a number you know, kind of designed to um, bring staff in, you know, maybe cover training, maybe cover education expenses, kind of lasting maybe for one to three years, um, kind of upon completion is anticipated that they will kind of fill, fill a, specific, a specified role within the city, um, kind of among those. But we kind of identified a lack of consistent and clear approach to workforce development programs across the city. So it's not always clear, you know, in terms of um, the response, you know, to, or a lot of times it's on the departments kind of creating these, kind of implementing these um, kind of themselves. Which, um, and then we also, um, you know, identify the lack of central or focused workforce development initiatives across the city. Um, you know, efforts kind of appeared to be, you know, inconsistent or kind of, you know, as based on management time or need. I mean, in order to do that, some positions may be discontinued for periods of time, such as due to funding or kind of others. There's not that, like, consistent kind of efficient approach or kind of that clear expectation that, you know, this one position is there. Um, as well as kind of policies, unclear policy procedures governing the establishment of programs and positions across the enterprise, ensuring that both departments are aware you know, the opportunities that can be developed and that programs are adequately documented and resourced um, to ensure alignment with expected outcomes. Um, so there's management action plan for this one, so that, you know, HR management acknowledges merits and findings of this audit issue. However, at this time, they are unable to provide um, an extensive management response on this issue as um, workforce development, especially the creation of um, employment pathways and training programs is an ongoing conversation with city departments who provide workforce development services um, the restructuring and centralization of major enterprise internship programs outside of HR, as well as the development of H the HR DEI strategic plan, was, um, which will specifically address workforce development needs and align with other city priorities and initiatives. These initiatives will likely not come together um, until with clearly cohesively with aligned strategic plans until late 20, or 20, until quarter three, quarter four of next year, um, and then management say that they can provide a more in-depth response at this time. So. Um, you know, target mediation dates, kind of that initial research band of next year, and then um, policy development potentially by um, the year after, or July afterwards. But um, our next one, issue 14, is candidate ranking and exams. So policy and procedures related to a candidate ranking exams are unclear and incomplete to ad adequately describe the processes. Um, so we noted for this one, you know, in terms of candidate ranking, um, we identified opportunities to provide better clarity. Um, to on these processes to HR, to hiring managers, and for HR business partner staff to ensure that they're conducted consistently and in accordance with expectations. So um, in terms of candidate ranking, there's a lack of clear policy procedure document specifying the candidate ranking process in greater detail, and, um, in order opportunities to kind of further define it and kind of explain it to candidates, um, as well as hiring managers express a lack of clarity um, pertaining to the, to the uh, clarity pertaining to kind of the creation of the eligibility list and the criteria the candidates are graded upon. Um, as HR business, as human resources business partner staff are the ones kind of conducting grading and kind of the ranking of candidates that are provided to, um, to hiring managers, um, as well as specific procedures of exams are not consistently documented and detailed 
to capture de key details in exam administrations. For this one, there's you know, potential for other exams, such as there might be a written exam, there might be, you know, depending on the needs for the position and kind of hiring managers' decisions and HR decisions, there's a number of, you know, beyond medical testing, there's potential for other um, exams or kind of up or testing of candidates, such as, you know, questions or on those way. And then as well, we were unable to identify, um, you know, clear detailed documentation of how HR administers these tests beyond relying on descriptions from staff and reviewing past exams to identify the formats in questions. Um, so the management action plan, so HR management has recently did redefine procedures and expectations um, requiring an exam component, scoring and ranking wall candidates. HR staff training with frequent management compliance monitoring has been effective in ensuring compliance with relevant governing rules and procedures. HR management will update or create policy, process, procedure, and resource documents to incorporate into the handbook in line with issue, audit issue one. And then detailed operation procedures will be created clearly defining HR management's expectation that scoring factors, point value, supplemental planning, um, questions and passing scores be agreed upon by the hiring managers and HR staff at the hiring meeting. Um, clear communication with hiring managers will highlight the impact a ranked eligible list has, has on the department in the review selection process and written deviation requirements. Um, this one is anticipated that by March 1st, um, this one will be remediated. Um, so the next one is um, the layoff and eligibility list. So um, layoff eligibility lists are inconsistently utilized across the enterprise with unclear expectations. Um, so policy and procedures for eligibility lists need strengthening to ensure clarity of departmental expectations and alignment with needs. Um, there is you know, language that you know, service service rules and collective bargaining agreements on creation of um, you know, layoff lists, including requirements around the duration of use, but there's not a complete uh, complete the appointment created policy and procedure on those um, layoff lists. And then um, in terms of layoff eligibility lists, you know, with, there's not an established departmental policy procedure link around um, the expectation on eligibility lists. So HR staff can kind of create, doesn't designate how long an eligibility list should be active for. So just 30, 60, 90 days. And that communication does not, may not always be communicated to hiring managers, kind of others who need to know it. Um, and so the result is that if they are, if a layoff is eligible and they need to go through it, they either have to go through the layoff, they go through the eligible list, or they have to wait for the process. So if an eligible list is not specific to the candidates that they are just looking for, kind of meet their needs, they may be waiting, you know, 30, 60 days till a list expires before they have to go again. Um, it's not, you know, they're not some frustration there because they're not always maybe clear about those as the eligible list may be used across multiple positions as well. So eligible list created for a position in one department may come come into play for another requisition process. And, especially now in the current market with, in terms of candidates, it's having many opportunities and money, um, you know, rating 30, 60, 90 days on a list, you know, may, they may not be interested, they may not be, you know, interested in that specific position, that department, um, but the city's kind of still has to go through that process as these lists are kind of still being set. But um, as you kind of noted in the eligibility list, you know, this language, there's a requirement in the civil service was on creation of an eligibility list, but there's not language on kind of the expectation on its use. So we identify opportunities to make sure that you know, it matches the current environment and current job market nowadays where employees may, employee, candidates may be expecting a, um, you know, quicker turnaround, they may not be interested over a period of time. Um, and then management action plan, so all current layoff, all current layoff eligible list policy procedures, pro, or policies, processes, procedures, and resource documentation um, will be reviewed and kind of aligned with um, that response to audit issue one. Um, a guideline room created for HR on eligible list guides, and then oversight, monitoring, and auditing incorporate written expectations that layoff lists and eligible lists are checked and utilized with overs oversight, review, and management reporting and auditing, auditing components. Um, this one is anticipated by June 1st, 2023. So this next one kind of appears grievances and other concerns. Um, so this one, <coughs> You kind of will see some similarity in terms of the investigations audit that's coming up, but we kind of looked at um, some processes specific to the hiring promotion process, such as you know avenues for um, you know they, those are the appeals, grievances, um, other complaints have kind of outlined in the report. But the procedures and expectations on appeals, grievances, and other channels, and other channels of concern about the hiring promotion process are not clearly documented and communicated. Um, for this one, we know that there, um, you know, the process. Are relatively as jointed with the ability to cross reference or kind of cross, ex uh, ability to kind of uh, look across each process for trends or kind of that way as each process is generally discrete among itself and kind of within different divisions or different um, components of the city. 
Um, for appeals, we identified a lack of clear expectations of how complaints should arrive, arrive um, as well as you know they may be occurring by email, kind of through written letter. There's not kind of that clear written um, way for people to know that way, as well as they may be arrived to different areas of HR. And then th that process is also not clearly described in terms of um, roles, and re roles and expectations for HR staff. Um, we you know observed a general understanding of what of what happens and occurs, but there's a lack of procedures and how the department investigates and handles appeals. Um, so the management action plan for this one, so management will consult with the city's attorney's office, um, HR investigative and labor relations unit, and the civil service commission chair to evaluate the current roles, processes, procedures, and communication of available reporting platforms related to complaints, grievances, and appeals for the purpose of, for the purpose of determining to the extent that changes are needed. Um, Human resources will ensure that all hiring related com complaint channels are aligned with HR investigation best practices with regard to departmental operating procedures and communication. And then HR management will collaborate with the HR investigations unit to align and create a cohesive and standardized complaint and response process and establish a shared tracking spreadsheet to cross reference informal HR complaints to identify and respond to trends. And this one is anticipated by March 1st, 2023. Um, so this next one kind of relates to department, to department appointed positions and interns. Um, so as you kind of outlined in the report, you know, a lot of there's the classified positions which have the civil service rules and those requirements, but then there's kind of a subset too that, you know, in terms of these unclassified, the ones that, you know, are not, not bound by the civil service rules, kind of bound by these merit-based process. And we identified um, some observations and kind of information related to these. Um, but policy and procedures for the hiring and promoted, promote, promoting for department appointed positions and interns need enhancing to ensure alignment with expectations for classified positions. Um, so we noted a lack of expectations um, and guidelines that are clear for both hiring managers and HR staff and how to go about these positions, kind of how they're handled. Um, we observed that there are unclear policies, procedures, and guidelines, um, you know, as they're all excluded from the civil service rule language and kind of other baseline criteria, um, opportunities to make sure that there is language that specifically includes these and kind of covers these unique positions in terms of how they or handles HR, you know, can set the HR in terms of the hiring process, you know, in terms of what expectations the HR sets or kind of how, how they should be required to go about um, as kind of depart, as management and departments can kind of ex exercise more discretion for these positions as well, because um, they are not bound by that civil service or merit based um, process. Um, so, HR man or management action plan, where appointments will continue at the discretion of appointing authority, HR management will review and update current documentation. Um, regarding appointing hiring processes, inclusive of operational procedures, options, guidelines, and determining if variances to utilizing a standard hiring process will need approval by HR management. Paid documentation will be included in the handbook and on city talk. And then paid student intern hiring processes will be evaluated to determine the viability of requiring a standardized process similar to um, that is used for hiring those, the hiring process in the classified service. Um, this one is anticipated by September 1st, 2023. It will be completed. Um, for these last two audit issues, um, we had a low risk. I'm going to go turn them over to come and already back up. Madam Chair, committee members, I'm going to cover the last two audit issues. Yeah, those two are low rate, low rate uh, audit issue. The feedback journals. Hiring and promotion process user feedback is not centrally and routinely solicited, solicited from all process participants and track to identify process improvements. Would you observe that the Human, Res Human Resource Department sent a satisfaction survey to a hiring manager at the end of hiring process. However, the survey is limited and candidate and new hire are not surveyed. The Women Resource Survey asked hiring managers several questions about the process. However, this process is not identified in the policy and procedure document. Some Women Resource Business Partner Team may send our survey for specific hiring process, processes to understand specific part of the process and results such as why a large number of candidates may, may not have participated in the selection process. 
this effort, however, this effort appear to be generally as determined and not consistent. In this one, we recommend, we, we have our recommendation, since it's the, this low rate uh, issue, we don't receive management response, but we will follow up on those. So internal audit will recommend that Women Resource Department management ensure the, the survey, the, ensure the survey process include role and responsibility uh, included in policy and procedure language for the department. Review the, the current survey and question asked. Consider way to adapt or expand a question to solicit relevant feedback to specifically identify that part, what part or the, the hiring process are working well, what part may need improvement, or where there may be process deviation or failure occurring. Uh, would you recommend that HR department develop a robust and comprehensive survey for others involved in the hiring and promotion process designed to solicit relevant feedback, such as from rejected candidates and new hires with the same consideration <coughs> as the survey sent to hiring managers? So we will follow up with this one, and we don't have any dates on. The, the, the low rates issue. The last one we found in this audit, uh, the systems. System functionality and limitation impact management effort to automate and use that data through the hiring and promotion process. Odi observe a number of areas of problem between the system used in hiring and promotion, including new gov, gov and comment, to ensure alignment and efficient processes. Odi note exams, as an example of, of system limitation of, proce of process resulting in work around. There is little oversight and monitoring of the data process, including inputs. But they also observe a need for explicit and clear data security consideration throughout the hiring and promotion process. OD also inform of known limitation in reporting process human resource department management for, from human resource department as desired, information may not be early, uh, easily reached without significant work around or customization of report. Internal audit recommend that human resource develop management continue, uh, human, sorry, internal audit recommend that human resource department management continue working with IT payroll and other involved stakeholders in to identify and prioritize system issue and area for improvement. In accordance with the prioritization, develop and document acceptable solutions that work for all parties and address the concern raised if possible or document area for future work or consideration. Consider and prioritize IT risk and data security as part of those discussions, including as part of risk assessment discussion and area for future work. This will conclude the issue presentation. And I'll turn back to Travis Kahn if it's for any question. Yeah, so I just want to say one final, Chair Pounds on the Committee, one kind of fan of thank you um, to HR management and kind of staff across the city for working with us on this one. This was, as you can kind of see by the report and by the presentation, you know, a lengthy, um, kind of thorough process. Um, and I think it yielded, you know, hopefully kind of some good benefits and results for the city as well. And as well, thank you guys for um, listening and kind of answering the questions. Um, 
if you have any questions for further for us, as well as HL management has anything they like to say, um, you know, feel free to do so. Thank you. I think we do have a few people that we just kind of want to talk more broadly about this. First of all, I have to say this is the largest audit that we've ever had before this body. So thank you for sticking in there with us through it. Um, thank you to our HR department for being very willing participants in this process. Um, that I think shows a lot in terms of acknowledgement of where that we need to change here and how we change. Um, I see and appreciate Bill Champa um, in the audience who spoke a little bit earlier, Deb Kruger, the director of the business operations, um, and Destiny was here also. I, I looks like she stepped out, but Destiny Zong is the business partner solutions um, leader in that department right now. Um, I'll start with Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I was curious um, what impact the new government structure had on this audit, and I'm <clears throat> assuming that this audit started long before a lot of this work, and the end result of government structure work is that a number of jobs either don't exist anymore or have been reclassified, and seeing these gaps in our procedures around classification and that kind of oversight, um, what, what did you, did you factor in the impact of government structure when you were looking at this? And could you maybe expand on what that impact might look like? Yep. Chair Palmasano, um, Kamima Payne, yeah, thank you for that question. And yeah, I think, um, so we began this audit early in the spring, I think probably back in February and March, began initial conversations. Um, as we know, you know, knew that there were government structure changes and changes to that ordinance. Um, as, part, as a result of that, we kind of focused on, um, you know, we, in this, scope of that, we excluded kind of politically, appoint, politically appointed. So the one, ones appointed by the council, ones appointed by the mayor, as we know, kind of know those are, you know, probably more maybe bound to change kind of that way. Um, but we kind of, you know, as we saw it kind of at the end, the focus on the appointment point of positions and others. Um, but we did not, you know, consider those changes because I guess, you know, in terms of the specific language, you know, in terms of, you know, for purposes of the process and audit, you know, we're focused on kind of what has occurred or kind of what is in place right now, knowing that, you know, there might be changes, but I guess too, on, you know, I guess I can't speak in terms of the specific changes that might occur as we go out of government structure, but I think the vast majority, you know, of the city's process is related to classified positions and kind of things that, you know, may not necessarily be impacted by those. But I think as you kind of saw management responses to, you know, there was kind of some conversation, kind of a, a um, we kind of made references to potential impacts of the government structure and kind of their work. But I think, you know, in terms of going forward that way, but. Um, you know, the conditions, the things that we know that are kind of occurring as now, and I guess, you know, without knowing, you know, specifically, you know, what the specific positions kind of that way, I don't anticipate too much of those kind of results change or being impacted by, um, you know, those changes that might be occurring within those, within those other positions. Mr. Fisher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, Mr. Common, it appears to me that the superstar of this report is Deb Kruger. <laughs> She's taking on seven of eight of high-risk um, areas as well as six of nine moderate areas. And it leads me, and apparently um, Ms. Kruger has changed positions from human re uh, resources manager now to interim director of business operations, so congratulations. Whichever one you are, Deb, thank you. Uh, but it raises a question in my mind about resources. Uh, this is a large load of work that has to be done in a relatively short period of time over 23 and, or 2023 and 2024. Some of these deadlines coming much sooner than 2024, all in 2023. And there are a number of areas here, um, items one and two I've picked out as well as item 11 where there are specific notes by management that there is lack of FT of uh, full-time employee resources. So uh, there's really two questions here and they're big. One, do we have enough resources to do all this work? And number two, are all the recommendations that management has adopted enough to eliminate the risks? Kind of a reinvent world question. 
um, Chair Palmasano, member, uh, Community Member Fisher, I think kind of, before I turn over to HR, I think in terms of talking about the staff and kind of those plans, I will say that, you know, in terms of, um, you kind of see some position title changes throughout there, but I think as my understanding that management was kind of designating, since there's a number of interim positions, um, kind of designating more of the position for some of these, um, but I think they can kind of speak more about the resourcing and kind of um, their efforts to um, address this one, or carry out the plans. Mr. Champa. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, committee member Fisher. Um, you're right, Deb Kruger is a rock star. She's a superstar. She's um, listed all over on this uh, project. Um, Deb and I go way back in terms of actually asking for process improvement. Uh, we've been looking at this for three or four years and then things like a hiring freeze hit and a uh, job bank and then all things related to COVID. And so we've been a little distracted resource wise, but to answer your specific question, uh, it, Deb and, and others, but led by Deb is the subject matter expert, has a, a, a lot of experience in this area. In terms of resources, uh, we had hoped and planned to devote a project manager to leading these efforts. Um, we are going to have to juggle resources to be able to do that. Um, we have about five other projects that we have going in addition to this one that are large, maybe not quite as large, but um, uh, it's our intent to, to find a project manager to help uh, lead these efforts. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Well, when I see, um, and Mr. Champa, thank you for answering the questions. When I see a note here that there may be insufficient F full-time employees, I want to call them FTEs, but full-time employees. Where does this all stand vis-a-vis -vis the budget currently? Um, I think it's still currently under uh, consideration. Are there requests for these FTEs in there, or is this still planned for future? Chair Palmasano, uh, committee member Fisher, uh, we had uh, expected to have an additional FTE devoted to this project, and, and, and we don't have that anymore. So uh, what we are trying to do is look at our existing complement of FTEs to support the projects that we have. We will likely come back and request um, an FTE to to uh, support this project. Yeah, if I may, Chair Palmasano, uh, I think as a, as a committee member, I, I understand the stretch of financial resources in the city and the competing requests for full-time hires to meet needs of the city across its enterprise. Um, I am hoping and recommending to our audit group as well as the HR group, just a recommendation, I have no authority to do anything, but some kind of risk assessment be established so that the city council can recognize and the budget committees can recognize that there may be risks here in the future more costly in saving the dollars now for FTE hires. My recommendation. Thank you for that. Um, we have others here in queue. We'll start with Commissioner Abeni. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, I just, everyone's mentioning this, but um, when I was taking notes, when I was reading through the packet of materials, I wrote magnum opus. So this is a big, big report, but I have to comment that I also think it's well written and well presented. So that makes it uh, useful to the, H the HR department, but also very transparent to the citizens of Minneapolis, which I think is just so critical. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I'm the park board um, commissioner member of this committee, um, and the park board is, has its own separate HR function and department. But that said, I, I'll be making sure that 
a copy of this is shared, because I think there are lessons learned throughout this that are probably broadly applicable to public sector HR departments, so thank you for that as well. Um, I did have one specific question to item 13, we're getting short on time maybe, but um, that was the workforce development, maybe briefly, was, um, was does that include professional development um, and, or is that more at the department level? So I'm thinking of certifications, train, outside trainings, um, licensure, I'm, I'm seeing a nod there. So that may be more at the departmental level, not centralized. Or Chair Ponson, or Commissioner Bennett, yeah, it's focused more on departmental kind of the development of to get staff and kind of for um, that. I think there's that, you know, as you point out, there's that training, you know, of staff kind of in the workforce, and that was not a focus of this engagement, but, you know, I think it's an important consideration as well. But Okay, thank you. And then just briefly, just a, a comment, sort of putting on my citizen hat maybe, too. Um, that I'm hoping that, um, because I see a theme, you know, this has been one year for me sitting on this on this um, committee, and um, that this is, that I'm hoping that with the new executive structure that that maybe we can, op, you know, sort of pivot and ha uh, develop more of a um, culture of continuous improvement um, at the departmental level here at the city of Minneapolis. I think it would be a, a great time for that, so uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Member Singleton. Thank you, Chair Palmazano. Um, I'll just start by echoing what um, a giant undertaking this is and how well written it is. Um, and, you know, similarly, I plan to take a lot of this back to my work in the nonprofit sector. Um, so I appreciate that work. Um, I had a question specifically about um, the enhanced analytics dashboards that you mentioned, I think, as a part of um, NeoGov that are being beta tested right now. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about those dashboards and then whether they might be applicable to other issues identified um, in the audit. Yeah. Chair Palmasan, um, can we remember Singleton, I think, HR, um, be able to provide a bit more thorough response to that one? I'm going to ask Deb Kruger to speak to that. Welcome, Ms. Kruger. Thank you for taking on all of these follow-up items. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm good, um, good morning, uh, Chair Palmasano, uh, committee members. I'm actually a little sad about my new role, but this is something I can dig my, my teeth into. Um, my passion and commitment to hiring and, and promotion here at the city is, is, uh, is as high as ever. Um, Chair Palmasano and, and House Member Singleton, so we are beta testing two new pieces of functionality um, in NeoGov. Just as an FYI, I'm on the advisory board of NeoGov, so we beta test a lot of their new functionality. Um, and one of the areas that I <clears throat> um, give them advanced sort of feedback and advice around is around analytics um, and um, dashboard and metrics and, and reporting. Um, so their, their new dashboard is a compilation of um, charts, visualizations on some of the major sort of nine box functions, if you will, of hiring, um, candidate health, application health, time to fill, um, um, how many days to open, um, candidate flow, candidate diversity. So there are sort of nine sort of canned areas, but then we have also have the ability to create customized um, reports. And it also benchmarks against um, other NeoGov users who opt in to share their data. And then we can benchmark against 15 uh, organizations who are closely aligned with the city of Minneapolis to see how we're doing um, in comparison. Um, and that will, we're beta testing that through January of 2023. They will do some tweaks based on feedback. And then I would expect by the end of Q1 to have that rolled out. And it's really nice because you can, you can send standardized reports and charts out to hiring managers and departments um, on a daily basis or whatever, you know, uh, frequency you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one thing, I wish that there was more in the management responses in the, because you know this document isn't big enough, <laughs> but still, um, 
I appreciate Commissioner Benet's question about tr training, right? And are there any more details that could be shared about training redesign? Chair Palmasano, um, what I will tell you is that um, one of our, um, I, I guess I wouldn't call it an aha moment, but one of our, um, what really shed some light in this report really was a couple of areas, and one is around training, communicating and training, not only to our HR employees, but to hiring managers. And we're gonna put um, a significant emphasis in um, that area. Um, and then also um, uh, follow up in terms of uh, kind of watching the process, monitoring the process. So um, in terms of training, um, we, we do um, quite a bit of training right now um, around um, the hiring and promotion process. Most of it is voluntary, and that's been really where the problem is. We've seen a significant drop off in attendance um, at our training in the last couple of years. And so we are going to go down a path of uh, more required training to be a part of our, our hiring and promotional processes. The other question I had, and it maybe articulates, maybe Commissioner Signal Singleton mentioned it, You know, how do you see some of these newer systems integrating into this work. I know that we are woefully behind on investment into HR systems, um, as we are in other places across the enterprise, but definitely HR is a particular pain point of that. Yeah. Um, my hope is that as we do these kinds of audits and identify high, high risk issues, that one of the follow-ups with that is that it is given higher priority in being able to fix the problems that come out of audits. Otherwise, what is the point of this exercise? So could you help us to appreciate how you, how new systems could help make this work better, just broadly speaking, not necessarily about NeoGov? Sure. Chair Palmasano, thank you for that question. Um, one of the advantages from where I sit is looking at all of the um, projects and systems that we have in the pipeline right now. And I mentioned five projects, and we've been pretty um, deliberate and intentional about alignment and where those projects align. Um, I'll talk about one specifically from a system standpoint. Um, we are... Um, starting to look at our, our um, enterprise, our ERP system, our Comet system. But embedded in that is the relationship to many other um, systems and processes, including many that are in this audit, uh, around things like training and development, our learning and development system, um, our workforce planning system, um, our um, uh, performance management system. Um, all of those will be um, reviewed in, in that process with a lens on uh, other projects like this audit, like the investigative audit, um, uh, our contract with our software for our performance management system um, is expiring. We've extended that, but we will be looking at that and how that all fits into um, not only the system, uh, but the process that we want as an outcome. Thank you. Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Chair Paul Masano. Yeah, I was curious to the role as, as far as the management response. A lot of these are going to cut across a number of hiring managers that don't currently exist within HR, but I would presume that a lot of the management response would have to be in collaboration with some of those hiring managers. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to the level of involvement or scope of you know, staff outside of HR and being able to respond to some of these findings. Sure, Chair Palmasano, Council Member Payne. Um, I'll talk first about HR. We are, um, as, as we mentioned earlier, we, I mean, we're, we're filling every FTE. We hired two new people today. Um, as part of our um, onboarding process with our 
all of our employees, including our new leaders, is an expectation around uh, this audit and our other priority projects. And so conversation around um, what that looks like and what the expectation is to complete this work. Uh, it gets a little more difficult outside of HR, but I think there is um, momentum and interest. I think you can see it in this, in this report. Um, people want to succeed, they want us to succeed. We want to hire the right people, the right time, right place, and I think that that's kind of a paramount to this. Everyone's stretched thin, but um, I think we um, have that support, and so it will be working through those managers in the departments and those department heads to make sure they're on board with, with the outcomes of, of this report. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from my colleagues? Seeing no further questions, thank you. Um, I'll move to direct the clerk to receive and file the report and direct staff to publish the report. That's my motion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That carries and the report has been received and filed and will be published today. Second, it's a little shorter, I promise, um, is the internal investigation process audit report. Um, Director Patrick, I'll have you queue up that presentation. Thank you, Chair Paul Masano, committee members. Again, uh, we'll be presenting the results of an internal investigation process audit today. So just some background, this arose during our risk assessment process uh, and kind of related overall to that general employee retention uh, portion of the, the risk assessment. And hence, the objective was to review the city's process for receiving and investigating internal complaints to ensure the consistency and adequacy of investigations. Uh, in scope for this project, we had the Human Resources Investigative Unit, the City Attorney's Ethics Officer and Ethics Process, and the Human Resources Business Partners Investigation Processes. Those are three separate processes, uh, which I'll discuss in the subsequent slides. Uh, policies and procedures are where we were looking for this. This was not necessarily a compliance audit, whether or not people were complying with policies and procedures, but more so a uh, performance audit in that how are policies and procedures in place? Um, and looking at those for a scope period of five years from 2017 through 2022. Uh, just to be clear, it excludes the police and civil rights departments. They do investigate complaints clearly, um, but they have their own very distinct processes, different bargaining agreements and an entirely different set uh, used to investigate those. Uh, and then also at that time, um, those were subject to state and federal investigations. There's a lot of change in that arena and we wanted to focus specifically on internal workforce complaints outside of that. So we have at the city a decentralized internal investigations process. Complaints are collected by the ethics officer, the human resources investigative unit or HRIU, uh, various additional human resource department staff, not part of the HRAU, department supervisors, managers, department heads, and we collect complaints through the Minneapolis Employee Report Line. That's a confidential reporting service someone can call and initiate a complaint through that. So there are, there are a lot of different channels that flow into uh, investigating an internal complaint. Uh, so who ultimately investigates the complaints determined by several factors. So the type of complaint may, may dictate, and you'll see what I'm talking about on a subsequent slide, where it comes in might dictate how it's resolved, and that might also, um, the parties involved might also. If we have uh, an employee or an appointed or an elected official, that may dictate how a complaint is ultimately investigated and resolved. So the Human Resources Investigative Unit, one of the parties, they receive complaints from um, just about any source. So they come into the Human Resources Investigative Unit 
and they specifically investigate one subset of internal complaints, and that is alleged violations of the anti-discrimination, harassment, and retaliation policy. So that is their jurisdiction and their arena to investigate. The ethics officer receives complaints via the employer report line or via a written form. Uh, the ethics officer doesn't investigate ethics complaints per se, it determines whether they warrant further investigation and then routes those complaints to the appropriate parties or it may be dismissed if there's no further investigation necessary. Uh, human resources business partners, so those assigned to the individual departments themselves, um, they may be assigned to one or more departments. They can receive, again, complaints from uh, many sources and they investigate complaints with the assistance of a department representative. Uh, so these complaints can travel around those three different groups. Someone may file a complaint with a human resources business partner who then determines it has some associated anti-discrimination, harassment, retaliation component. Then it is presented then to the HR investigative unit who may investigate the case. So it's not that a complaint has only uh, needs to stick in one bucket. It may travel around, and that's true for complaints that come in at any source. Uh, next, I'll talk about the results. We identified seven issues, and we'll go through each of those in turn. So the first issue is kind of the governing and overriding issue that we saw in the report, and that's internal investigations, policies, and procedures, and um, kind of a lack of a centralized policy and procedure. So there's no enterprise-wide integrated complaint investigations process. Each of these three different units, even though they may be addressing similar subject matters, similar complaints, there's not one source of guidelines for how complaints should be resolved. Uh, and the, hence, that makes it so that there are inconsistent guidelines for how to resolve complaints across the city. Uh, there doesn't appear to be a regular policy and procedure review as each group has their own independent policies and procedures a consistent and routine review of those uh, processes, policies, procedures used to investigate complaints. So as such, we saw kind of a, not necessarily in conflict, but very differing levels of documentation and methods for resolving complaints, even though they may touch on the same or similar issues. So management um, has agreed to uh, analyze the investigation procedures in conjunction with the January 2022 creation of that position, which is the Director of Internal Workforce Investigations, again, that oversees those anti-discrimination and harassment complaints. Um, and there are ongoing discussions on how to expand that process, the Director of Workforce Investigations, to cover more complaints beyond just that ADH and R scope. Uh, such an expansion would require additional resources, as that team is limited currently in, in both staffing, um, and, and mission to ADHR complaints. So likely additional resources would be needed if we were to kind of think about consolidating more complaints under that HR investigations director, internal workplace investigations unit. Uh, HR is con intends to leverage these results and recent efforts to continue to expand those process materials. So using one set of foundational process materials from the HR investigative unit broaden those out to make sure that there are consistent practices across the enterprise for all investigations, um, regardless of the nature of the complaint. NHR will also consider whether it would be beneficial to adopt a citywide policy addressing complaint investigations. So that's, a, that's a different process to adopt a citywide policy, but that, that will be explored. Uh, the target remediation date is January 2, 2024, uh, and the responsible party will be the Director of Internal Workplace Investigations. Uh, for the remainder of the uh, findings, I'm going to turn it over to our auditor, Allison Newman, who worked with me extensively on the project. Welcome, Allison Newman. Good morning, Chair Palmasano, committee members. Um, audit issue two is related to centralized case management and a mechanism for data analytics. Audit recommends the city create guidelines for consistent, consistently tracking case data across the enterprise. The city ethics officer and HR have agreed to create a documented process for this. Additionally, they agreed to explore the increased use of a case management system, which is already in place, to include controlled and logged access.
And this issue has a target remediation date of January 2nd, 2024. Um, audit issue number three is related to ensuring proper complaint routing, ensuring investigators are free from bias, and all relevant stakeholders are notified. Audit recommends the city establish a complaint routing policy and procedures, ensure notification to all relevant stakeholders, and establish a policy and procedures for investigators' selection and screening for bias. Management stated in their response they would address this as part of their response to audit issue number one. And the target remediation date for that is also January 2nd, 2024 for audit issue number three. Audit issue number four is related to balancing investigator workloads evaluating skill sets and bandwidth. Audit recommends the city establish documented procedures to include a system that helps optimize investigative resources while also balancing caseload levels and evaluating skill sets of investigators and investigator bandwidth. In management's response, they stated they would address this as part of their response to audit issues number one and number two and HR stated it intends to develop processes to remediate those findings. Thank you. This also has a target remediation date of January 2nd, 2024. Okay, thank you. So for audit issue number five, uh, this is related to review of investigations prior to final disposition. Audit recommends the city establish an integrated enterprise-wide policy and procedures to review internal complaints and internal investigations prior to final disposition. Management stated they would address this as part of their response to audit issue number one. Further, the HRIU, the Human Resources Investigative Unit, has already developed processes that will assist with this work. HR has agreed to work with the City Attorney's Office to remediate this issue as well. And this also has a target remediation date of January 2nd, 2024. And for audit issue number six, uh, this is related to formal training requirements, competencies, and training records. Audit recommends the city establish formal training requirements and competencies for city staff who handle internal complaints and conduct internal investigations to occur at least annually. HR agreed to require annual training for all HR employees who conduct investigations at a minimum However, should investigators be centralized, possibly within the HRIU, HR would possibly require investigators to meet certain industry standard training requirements. This audit issue has a short-term target remediation date of May 1st, 2023 and a long-term remediation date of January 2nd, 2024. And finally, audit issue number seven is related to data retention and destruction guidelines for complaint data. Audit recommends the city incorporate data collection, retention, and destruction guidelines for complaint data and internal investigations into an enterprise-wide integrated complaint handling and internal investigation policy and procedures and centralized case management system with easy to understand criteria and examples of situations when each retention schedule should be utilized to conform with the city of Minneapolis state approved retention schedule regarding complaint data. Management stated they will address this as part of issue number one in their response and further stated they will wait for updated retention schedules 
which are currently being prepared by the city clerk's office. And this issue also has a target remediation date of January 2nd, 2024, or within three months of the updated retention schedule from the clerk's office, whichever <coughs> comes later. And now I'll turn it back over to Director Patrick to conclude. Thank you, Mrs. Newman. I know we blazed through uh, another, what would be considered a long report where we do not have presented the hiring and promotions audit. Uh, we moved through this one relatively quickly. Um, I think the issues in the report kind of speaks for itself. Again, the central theme of which being consistency across the various places that take in complaints and process them and appropriate layers of oversight throughout the process so that we're tracking each complaint and ensuring that the appropriate kind of oversight and management actions are taken before a complaint is resolved. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Um, do my colleagues have questions on this report? I'll just pause. Councilmember Payne. Sorry, I stepped away. Uh, thanks. Chair Palmisano, uh, I was curious if there was any consistency as to whether investigations would be conducted by internal staff versus hiring of external partners. Uh, Chair Palmisano, Committee Member Payne, there are some guidelines as to when an external party would be um, used to investigate a complaint. So in instances certainly where there may be an elected official or something of that nature, may use an outside source to investigate that complaint or where um, the issue is deemed high, high enough risk that we would prefer to have an outside party. Uh, part of the audit and part of developing <coughs> consistency is making sure those um, there are clear guidelines for when that would occur. Um, we do maintain contracts with several outside investigative firms so that they are on standby in those instances that, in which they're needed, uh, but making sure that's clearly communicated across all the parties who conduct investigations to know when to refer that back up so that it might be handled by an outside investigator that'll be, I imagine, addressed in updated policies. Yeah, and as a follow-up, yeah, I think you kind of spoke to this, but maybe I'll just ask it explicitly around the discretion that we have in terms of deviating from those guidelines. And then uh, second question is, for those third-party investigators, is there any kind of oversight process to ensure they don't have any biases or um, conflicts in terms of the investigation. Uh, Chair Palmasano, Committee Member Payne. Um, as far as bias checks for the independent investigators, um, one would assume that the bias checks that will be integrated into all investigations would apply to anyone who's investigating a case. So that that is something that is was stated in the report to be developed. Um, could could you repeat your first question? I. It, was it overrides of the discretion of, to you know make a decision to do an internal versus external investigation uh chair palmasano committee member Payne, um, with clear documentation on when when that would be used i think it'll be clear that when um an override could happen so uh, with consistent management oversight of the process so that it's occurring per policy and a consistent enterprise complaint management policy um, those instances in which there may appear to need an override, hopefully that will contribute to the evolution of an, uh, a more coherent policy over time. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? Seeing no further questions or comments from committee members, I'll move to direct the clerk to please receive and file this report and direct staff to publish the report. That's my motion anyway. All those in favor, please say, Please signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That carries, and the report has been received and filed and will be published today. Before we get to what's typically next, our report from internal auditor, um, we felt it important to bring everyone up to speed on uh, you know, the, the state, the timeline of our audit committee, of the office itself, um, and we've asked from the city clerk's office, Kate Redden, to help us um, just kind of level set for everybody so that everyone has the same information. Um, council members that are colleagues have gotten presentations on this 
uh, already, but I just wanted everybody to, clarity is important. So thanks for being here, Kate. Redmond. Absolutely. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Palmasano and members of the Audit Committee. As Chair Palmasano said, my name is Kate Redden, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Manager of Administrative Services for the Legislative Department, which the Office of City Auditor is just one part of. And we will be uh, with our Interim City Auditor, Ryan Patrick, presenting a brief update regarding the Office of City Auditor and the Reconstituted Audit Committee. Now to start, I do want to go over some brief historical information just to make sure we're all on the same page here. In November 2021, City Question 1 related to a new government structure was voted upon and passed by Minneapolis voters, which essentially created a new Executive Mayor Legislative Council system of government. One of the impacts of this work was the creation of a new City Auditor position, which was designed to be appointed by an independent audit committee, and this position would be responsible for providing independent objective assurance and consulting services, and to evaluate and improve the effectiveness of the City's operations. In addition to the duties prescribed in the Charter, this position will also oversee the work of the two primary divisions of the office. The current one is the Audit Division, which uh, provides risk-based and objective auditing, advice, and insight through comprehensive enterprise audits and consultative services. The newly formed Policy and Research Division will generally provide professional nonpartisan research, analysis, evaluation, and consulting services for the City Council. As a result of this position being created earlier this year, the City Clerk and the Human Resources Department were directed to bring forward recommendations for establishing, classifying, and compensating this position. This work was done in uh, consultation with an outside vendor who conducted an independent study of comparable positions in comparable jurisdictions, so essentially other cities that have strong or executive mayor systems of government. Those recommendations were looked at in um, coordination with the recommendations in the city charter. And at the August meeting earlier this year, the audit committee approved the general draft job description, uh, duties and pay that came from that study. With the recent announcement that the governor's office will be increasing the salary cap limit for government employees starting January 1st of next year, um, they will be increasing that to $206,000. This means the city can now begin its work to actually recruit and hire a city auditor, which will then also let us begin the work on the new audit committee. Earlier today, the Human Resources Department did post the City Auditor job uh, posting on our website. It will be available for applicants for up to three weeks, which would have the posting closing on Friday, December 23rd. Should everything go well, HR will be reviewing applications for minimum qualification checks during the last week of the year. And then uh, members of the interview panel could actually interview candidates during the first week of January. And we should be able to make an offer to the selected candidate during the middle of January, around January 16th. This would then allow us to come back to the audit committee meeting on February 6th, which I believe is a Monday, to give final recommendations and receive final approval for this individual. Over the next three weeks, applicants will be able to find the job posting in a number of locations like the city's job board, the city's social media channels, and LinkedIn account. We'll also have some targeted local efforts with organizations like the League of Minnesota Cities job board, and we'll use some online job platforms like Minnesota Go uh, minnesotajobs.com, governmentjobs.com, and some appropriate professional association job websites like the Institute of Internal Auditors, Association of Local Government Auditors, and related. What is important to note about the timeline that you see on the screen is we've left a bigger chunk of time in January, so should there be any delays, which can happen, background checks end up taking a little longer than we expect, maybe there are problems scheduling interviews, we're still confident that we'll be coming to that February 6th meeting with a finalized candidate. Finally, in your packet materials, I'd like to point out two things. First, you have a copy of that timeline in front of you. And then second, the finalized job description. The general job description was voted on by the Audit Committee in August. HR finished their work, and with the governor's salary cap increasing in January, this was effectively uploaded into the city's database last week. At this time, I'm happy to stand for any questions about that recruitment, and if there are none, I'd be happy to invite Mr. Patrick up to talk about next steps from there. Thank you. Are there questions about the process that this will undergo from my colleagues? I'm not seeing any. Uh, and just some additional comments on non-city auditor hiring process components. Uh, specifically, the reconstitution of the new audit committee is intended by Q2 of 2023. 
uh, we'll need to go through a posting, recruitment, interview, and appointment process for new audit committee members. And again, recognizing the fact that under the new charter, uh, the composition of the audit committee has changed to include more community members. Uh, throughout this process, we'll be, as, as you all know, we reevaluate and reaffirm the audit charter on an annual basis. Uh, as such, we'll be drafting some extensions to the audit charter to incorporate um, the new process for delegating work to council via the policy and evaluation division. That document um, is affirmed by, by uh, the audit committee should not change the current audit function. That, that continues to happen as, as it always has, uh, but would incorporate, again, this new policy and evaluation division needs to be considered in the audit charter. Uh, and then, again, we'll, throughout this process, we will be um, working on the hiring process for the policy and evaluation division staff, as that will take people to do. Happy to stand questions, for any questions. Thoughts? Ideas? It is certainly um, our intention to delegate work back to the council from the policy and evaluation division, and that is one of those things that we need that new audit committee uh, seated in order to do. Is that your understanding? It would be my, uh, Chair Palmasano, it would be my understanding and my recommendation that the, the new audit committee adopt the charter so that everyone is clearly operating under a charter. Uh, an audit charter, um, as is required by the international standards set by the IAA. Um, and in that charter, uh, to establish a clear expectation of how that work flows to council would be, would be necessary so that it's not happening on an ad hoc or, or haphazard basis. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Not seeing any. Thanks. All right, seeing no further questions or comments from committee members, um, I'll ask the clerk to please just receive and file that report. And next we'll have the regular report from the internal auditor, the auditor update. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, this should be a brief update. Uh, we will primarily discuss the minor budget update, well, major budget, budget update if you're internal audit. Um, the, we've completed our hiring and promotions process audit, although work will be ongoing on that for the next several years. Uh, similarly, the internal investigations process audit. We have ongoing currently the IT outage after action review. Uh, it's assessing the remaining risks and issues that were involved in the August 27, 2022 major systems outage, and that is in progress. Uh, we are currently starting off our 2023 enterprise risk assessment that will be um, deeply instrumental in how we structure next year's audit plan. I would anticipate uh, you'll hear from us during the risk assessment process as we reach out to um, other members of the city to discuss the, the current existing risks as we do also our, our nationwide trend analysis. So that will be going on and presented back to the audit committee at the beginning of the next year. Uh, the one other update that I wanted to provide was the budget update. So the mayor's budget markup occurred on December 1st, 2022, uh, in that the city auditor's budget, without going through the history of kind of the changes of the charter um, and, and who would be involved and what, what the city auditor's office would be, the city auditor's office budget was amended to include FTEs for the policy and evaluation division. Uh, to move law enforcement auditors from the police department to the city auditor's office to serve as community safety auditors and to provide program funding for policy and evaluation division. So having, having dollars, not just FTEs, is important to, to make sure that program can successfully operate. Uh, we've discussed the law enforcement auditor position in prior audit committee meetings. I can answer any additional questions about that that you have, but that is that is directly tied to prior meetings that we've had in which we've discussed that. Uh, committee member Koski requested research and report back to the committee on that. And then the policy and evaluation division staff will need to go through a job analysis um, to build those positions. That can take some time to do. Um, and having some clarity on what this, what this body is actually gonna do is a, a pretty big part of, of doing those job analysis questionnaires. So that, that will be an ongoing project over the next several months. 
happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, uh, that we have no new major updates. We will be adding a number of issues to our prior audit issue follow-up, obviously, as a result of these two reports. We'll continue to report back on that in subsequent meetings. Mr. Fisher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, I, I had asked uh, an innocent question of Director Patrick earlier this week about two new public safety auditors being added to the <clears throat> new office of uh, city auditor. Um, are those transfers from another division or are they actually new FTEs? Committee member, uh, Chair Palmasano, Committee Member Fisher, those are transfers from the police department. So the police department had allocated two positions as specifically police auditors under their uh, department. Those positions were then transferred to audit um, as community safety auditors. So addressing not just police, but the entirety of the community safety branch on the new org chart. Uh, just to clarify, if I may, Chair Palmasano. <clears throat> so, um, the law enforcement or public safety auditors now in the Minneapolis Peace Department are transferred or are under the authority of the Office of City Auditor, but there's no overall enterprise-wide addition of FTEs for public safety audit, is that correct? Uh, Chair Palmasano, uh, Committee Member Fisher, the money for those two positions was already allocated in the police budget. So this wasn't, does not appear to be a creation of a new position that was a transfer from one department to another. Okay, thank you. It also might help to know that those were those positions were never filled. They were sought after, they were posted, but there was never hiring done for those positions. Um, just, I think that kind of a position is difficult to come by. Uh, other questions or comments from my colleagues? Not seeing any. So thank you, I'll direct the clerk to please receive and file that report. Last but not least, are there any announcements? <coughs> All right, thank you for this, staying here for this um, very long meeting. Thank you um, to, our, uh, to our partners across the city, seeing no further business before us and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you everyone. <laughs>